We've seen a few red priests and priestesses who serve the Lord of Light in the series, but Melisandre does stand out from this crowd. Seeing visions in the flames and manipulating fire is what your average trained red priest is capable of doing, yet we've seen Melisandre do things with magic far beyond that. One of the first strange things we see her do is drink a poisoned cup of wine handed to her in an attempt to assassinate her. How she survived this isn't clearly stated, but by how calm she gulps down the poison gives us a hint. The night is dark and full of terrors, old man. But the fire burns them all away. In all the books, we only get one POV chapter from her, but we do get some insight into this super mysterious character. This is a quote from chapter 31 of the fifth book of Dance of Dragons. Danger to her own person was the first thing she had learned to see, back when she was still half a child, a slave girl bound for life to the Great Red Temple. It was still the first thing she looked for whenever she gazed into a fire. So we can assume that earlier, she saw in one of her visions that her life was in danger and took some preventative action. I'm guessing she took some kind of antidote that would render the poison useless on her. It could also be that since her body is always hot, it burned the poison away, but I don't know if that's how it would work. I'm not a scientist, I just make some videos. I know this would fall under the magic that all red priests can do, but what she does next definitely isn't. This was only shown once in the show, but Melisandre birthed two shadow figures called Shadow Assassins. This is not something taught at the Red Temples of the Lord of Light. Melisandre is from Essos, where this religion is a prominent one. And as far east as this map goes is a city called Ashai. This is where she's from. Dark and taboo magic usually looked down upon is openly practiced in Ashai. The darkest of all magic users are called shadow binders. Like the name suggests, they can control shadows. We know that she sleeps with the honorable and married Stannis in order to create their shadow baby. Stannis stood no chance against his younger brother Renly's army in the War of Five Kings, but with the shadow assassin, Renly was quickly taken care of. The other shadow assassin they create in the books was made to kill a character named Courtney Penrose. He was a man in charge of Storm's End, the Baratheon's home castle. Stannis wanted him killed because he was protecting one of his older brother Robert's bastards. The shadow assassins looked like Stannis' shadow, but it was an easy way for Stannis to get away with Kinslaying since who would believe a shadow was running around killing people? The shadow is born with a mission and disperses after completing it. I don't think that Stannis or Melisandre have control over it. Stannis does say to Davos that he dreams of Renly's death even though he wasn't there. He says, I dream of it sometimes, of Renly's dying. A green tent, candles, a woman screaming, and blood. The woman screaming would be Brienne of Tarth, who was present and has been blamed by some for Renly's murder. Since creating the two shadow assassins, Stannis has noticeably aged and Melisandre is afraid that creating another one would kill him. Melisandre then resorts to blood magic to have the other people opposing Stannis killed. The bastard Courtney Penrose was protecting at Storm's End was Edric Storm, and since Melisandre believed him to have King's blood, his blood was needed. His story was given to Gendry in the show. Melisandre had the bastard's blood leached and burned to kill the other opposing kings in Westeros. Is it a rough start? Is it a Balon Greyjoy? Is it a Joffrey Baratheon? I'm not sure how much this blood magic ritual was responsible for Robb Stark's, Joffrey's, and Balon Greyjoy's death like she intended it to, but they all did end up dying very soon after. What she wanted to do with Robert's bastard was actually burn him alive like she regularly does as a sacrifice to her god, the Lord of Light. But as you guys know, Davos comes to the rescue and lets him sail away to safety away from the Red Witch. Melisandre admits that her manipulation of fire has just only been a trick. When traveling to Westeros, she brought over a variety of powders that she's been hiding in her robe sleeves. She says that she has powders to turn fire green or blue or silver. Powders to make a flame roar and hiss and leap up higher than a man is tall. Powders to make smoke, a smoke for truth, a smoke for lust, a smoke for fear, and the thick black smoke that could kill a man outright. But in the recent story, she's become powerful enough to not need these tricks. While she's up in the north, she claims the wall's magic has made her more powerful than ever. When a wildling wargs into an eagle above them, Melisandre is able to just light the bird on fire and kill it from a distance. Other red priests and fire magic users credit this boost in power to the birth of Daenerys' dragons. They are also able to just magically summon fire and do cool tricks to convince crowds to join their religion and cause. 
The alchemists in King's Landing say it's become easier to produce wildfire recently too. The only other Shadowbinder so far in the series is Quaith, and she's even more mysterious than Melisandre. She also backs the claim of dragons strengthening their magic. We don't see much of her, but in the books, she visits Daenerys a couple times at night when she's asleep. Daenerys confuses her visits as dreams, since she appears in a shadowy-like figure and is somehow able to get through all her guards. But this isn't Quaith's physical body. She comes to Daenerys to tell her prophecies using magic. This is either some more shadowbinding magic, or she's using something called glass candles. Glass candles are magical Valyrian artifacts that sorcerers use to communicate with others anywhere in the world. They are made of obsidian, also known as dragon glass, and only work when they are burning. This sounds simple, but they haven't burned for a long time, and only recently done so since magic in the world is more powerful. Quaith follows the Ashai tradition of covering her face. I remember years before that scene where we learned Melisandre's identity of an old and frail looking woman. Fans already theorized that she was hiding her true appearance with magic. Being a younger, more attractive woman would make her mission a lot more easier, so it made sense. But we don't know if the same thing will happen in the books. The Shadowbinders of Ashai get even creepier when you learn that they are the only ones who eat the blind and deformed fish that live in the polluted river by Ashai. This river is black in the day, but at night have a green glow. How Shadowbinders are cool with eating polluted food could also explain how Melisandre survived that poison. Quaith does come off as a wiser and more dependable reader of visions in comparison to Melisandre. Melisandre has little control of what she sees in the flames, and her interpretations of the visions are hit or miss. She expresses how difficult it can be to read them when thinking to herself, since they can be so vague. We also learn the toll it takes on a red priest. She says, Seeing was never as simple as those words suggested. It was an art, and like all art, it demanded mastery, discipline, study, pain, that too. Roller spoke to his chosen ones through blessed fire, in a language of ash and cinder and twisted flame that only a god could truly grasp. Melisandre had practiced her art for years beyond count, and she had paid the price. Smoking blood begins to drip down her leg after looking to the fire for a long time in the same chapter. We also learn that she doesn't really acquire food or sleep, and that her god provides her with everything she needs. Even in the horrible conditions on the wall, she remains warm, not needing much clothing. She keeps the part about not needing food to herself, however, and eats meals even when she doesn't need to. We've seen this before in the books with Zombie Cold Hands and Beric Dondarrion after he's come back to life. These two both don't eat or sleep. Beric's resurrection by the Red Priest Thoros of Mir isn't something that normally happens in this religion and is seen as some phenomenon. What Thoros intended to do was just perform a ritual called the Last Kiss, where Red Priest breathes fire into a dead follower of the Lord of Light as a way to cleanse the corpse. Somehow, Beric kept coming back to life, and Melisandre does something similar in the show, minus the fire breathing, to bring Jon back. In the books, Jon Snow has just died, and we don't know how he's going to come back, but it's likely in a similar fashion. In Melisandre's vision in the books, when she keeps looking for Stannis in the flames, all she sees is Jon, so he's the man she's likely to follow when she eventually realizes Stannis is not the promised prince. The last of her magic that we see is glamouring. This is the magic used to conceal her identity in the show and twist the appearance of Mance Raider in the books. Here stands your king of lies. Behold the fate of those who choose the darkness. It seems like it's more shadow binding than it has to do with the Lord of Light, but Melisandre intertwines the two by saying shadows serve the light. Glamouring uses light and shadows to create this illusion, but also uses a suggestion. But more importantly, a ruby is involved that the user needs to wear. If you were a Mance Raider fan in the show, I've got good news for you. Melisandre lets him live in the books by switching his appearance with Rattleshirt, also known as the Lord of Bones. So that man who was burnt alive was Rattleshirt, and Mance has been pretending to be him. When Mance begins to complain about always having to wear Rattleshirt's armor of bones, Melisandre tells him, The bones help. The bones remember. The strongest glamours are built of such things, a dead man's boots, a hank of hair, a bag of finger bones. With whispered words and prayer, a man's shadow can be drawn forth from such and draped about another like a cloak. The wearer's essence does not change, only his seeming. She made it sound a simple thing and easy. They need never know how difficult it had been, or how much it had cost her. That was a lesson Melisandre had learned long before Ashai. The more effortless the sorcery appears, the more men fear the sorcerer. When the flames had licked at Rattleshirt, the ruby at her throat had grown so hot that she had been feared for her own flesh and might start to smoke and blacken. So we learned that this magic could also bring her a significant amount of pain that she continues to bear. 
This is the interesting quote we get from when she removes the glamouring magic on him. Melisandre touched the ruby at her neck and spoke a word. The sound echoed queerly from the corners of the room and twisted like a worm inside their ears. The wildling heard one word, the crow another. Neither was the word that left her lips. The ruby on the wildling's wrist darkened, and the wisps of light and shadow around him withered and faded. So just some more creepy stuff from the Red Witch. I think it's going to be interesting to see her future relationship with Jon in the coming book, if she does bring him back to life, like she did in Season 6 of the show. If we get any more magic from this character or any other Shadowbinder, what you guys think we'll see? There's limitless possibilities when dealing with shadows. But anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys soon.